for being here. My name is Marina Romani, and I'm the, one of the co-organizers and the moderator for this uh, wonderful panel tonight. And uh, um, I am really honored to facilitate this event, which is really a unique event here to see Berkeley, and bringing these amazing artists from the Bay Area, these cultural workers, uh, that are really leaders in the community uh, in the Bay Area and bringing them into conversation uh, about this particular project that I'm going to give you a little bit of a context for. Uh, before introducing our speakers tonight, uh, I want to uh, really thank uh, the generous uh, departments at UC Berkeley who sponsored this event. First of all, the Department of Anthropology who is hosting us, that's also hosting us and we are very grateful for this beautiful space for creating this space for us. And then the Department of Ethnic Studies, the Department of Music, and the Center for Latin American Studies. We are very grateful for your support. And then we're also grateful for, to the National Endowment for the Art, that's the main sponsor for this series, and also to La Peña Cultural Center. And tonight, actually, we have Natalia Nera Tamal, one of the co-directors of La Peña Cultural Center, with us. So, Thank you, Natalia, for being with us. We love La Peña. And, um, and also, I want to thank Gabriel Sanchez from the Department of Anthropology for being an amazing organizer. And I want to thank Aditi Raguna for the wonderful poster design. Thank you. And, um, it's been really wonderful to organize this panel, and I thank you for your time, for your expertise and for sharing your knowledge with us today. Okay, so uh, before I stop talking, I want to give a little bit of introduction about the context of this, of this panel. So um, the dis this discussion is part of the series Timeless Archetypes of Women in Music and Dance, sponsored by the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, and La Peña Cultural Center. And this panel was initially conceived by Maria de la Rosa, uh, who is the series director and one of our panelists tonight. And uh, um, this series has engaged more than 30 artists to conduct community workshops and live performances, calling attention to the crucial and often difficult roles that women have played across societies, cultures and generations. The series has featured artists active in the Mexican, Puerto Rican, Peruvian and contemporary Latino artistic traditions and it has invited them to consider critically women's roles, how they are reflected in archetypes of femininity, and how these archetypes have evolved and are still manifested in today's society. Today we will hear from the series four artistic directors, who are an amazing artists and who have been cultural leaders in the Bay Area and beyond for many years. And I want to give a short bio for each one of them, and then we'll hear more about from them. So I want to start with Maria, Maria Rosa, she's the, she's the, the series director the, of Timeless Archetypes of Women in Music and Dance. Maria is native of San Jose, California. She's an award-winning artist, musician, educator, and curator of folkloric music programming, as well as artistic director of the San Jarocho Ensemble, Via Pason, which regularly appears throughout the Bay Area and beyond, performing at venues such as the Oakland Museum of California, Mexican Heritage Plaza, the Young Museum, San Francisco Arts Mission, among many others. Maria has been artistic director of Los Lupeños de San Jose, and with the 2014 Paz Fandango Urbano project, Maria launched a year-round Son Harucho programming at La Peña. Maria has a BA and a master's from Stanford University, and she holds a professional clear California teaching credential. And uh, again, she's the series director of the, of the series. Uh, what can we do? Iliana, Iliana Herrera. Iliana is a singer songwriter, recording artist, and cultural worker based in the Bay Area. Over the last 20 years, she has connected her experiences working with a vast array of communities to musical and theatrical collaborations, such as the Teatro Campesino, Golden Gate Opera, Galleria della Raza, the, the Young Museum, Mission Culture Arts Center, Rava Women for the Arts, and La Peña, among many others. Hailing from a Southern California musical border family, she bridges her bicultural roots to the arts and social justice through music as a language justice, justice interpreter and linguist and voiceover artist. Liliana is also the lead singer of Oakland-based cumbia dub band Candelaria. Shefali uh, Show. Shefali is a dance instructor, choreographer, artist, and environmental justice educator. 
She's the co-director of the Bombay Plena Workshop at La Peña and the artistic director of performance at Aguacero. She regularly presents at schools, universities, festivals, and events throughout California. She has performed at the San Francisco Ethnic Festival Dance, Cuba Caribe, the Bon Plein Art in New York, and was featured at the West Wave Dance Festival. Most recently, just a few months ago, Shefali was one of four leaders of the ninth annual Encuentro de Tambores in Puerto Rico, representing and performing with the diaspora delegation. And incidentally, Shefali has been my teacher for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, Gabriela Chiroma. Gabriela is a pioneer of afro peruvian dance movement in the Bay Area. She's a choreographer, producer, dancer, teacher, and cultural activist who has been teaching and producing afro peruvian dance and musical events in the Bay Area for over 30 years. Gabriela has done field trips and dance research in Ghana, Togo, Chile, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Uruguay, among many other countries. And she has stopped and coordinated workshops in afro peruvian music and dance at university and cultural centers internationally. Thank you, Gabriela. So we do have an exceptional party. So I, my role is just to be a facilitator of this conversation. So I'm going to start with a couple of questions, but then feel I really want to encourage you to just raise your hands and uh, uh, feel free to participate in the conversation because we really want to share this work with the whole community. So my first question, first question uh, it would be if you could describe for our audience tonight uh, the concept behind the concert that you uh, for this series. So the concert that you will perform, that you will direct, or that you have directed in the past months. And I would like to start with Marielle as the series director, if you give the audience a sense of the series and of the concept. So, uh, yes, and thank you Marina for being here and doing this. <laughs> yes. But you see that they occur all over. 
And I realized then, uh, when I started thinking about this is this is this is an archetype. This is, is something that we share uh, throughout the world. Um, every culture probably has some representation of the Bedenera. And so that's what I wanted to build my project around. Um, and at the time it was just a concert and we had gone a couple of times uh, for a, different, a couple of different um, uh, grants. Um, and I got pretty close, really close, um, to some big ones. And ironically enough, and, I, and you know, there's, there's politics around it, and, this is, and it was part of the struggle in this whole thing was um, there were panels that kind of shut the door, you know? And, you know, I can't say for not, because I wasn't there in the room, but, you know, there's always this sense of, okay, why, you know? Anyway, so there was that little struggle going on all along. So when, when uh, but La Peña was the one that was helping me over the years. We kept a couple of times, several times, you know, and when the NEA one came up, um, originally in my project, I had wanted to invite the rest of the, my colleagues here, to do a piece in that show. But when La Benia approached me and said, hey, we want to do the NEA, we want to pick up your, your Petaneras project, but we want to, can you do something that's a four concert series? Because we want to approach it as a four concert series. And by that time, I had studied enough with, with Edgar and Shafali and Gabriela and I had worked together, together for years um, on different projects as well. But I realized that each one of us had enough material for our concert. Um, and that there, was, uh, that there was these archetypes that I was seeing, not just the Petanera, but other archetypes within the Mexican folklore exist as well in other folklore and other culture and um, and so that's how that's where I went with, with that and it made sense because I mean I was I've been working with La Bella now for since about 2011 2014 was the, the big Nexus project and in that whole transition piece um, I was out of that about um, focusing on the people who were at the plaza, and at the plaza at, the, at, the, at La Peña, that had grown these communities, and it's, and it's these people right here, you know, and they've been there for years, and they've been there, and they have huge communities there. I was the newest kid on the block, you know, but and so it totally just made sense to to pull that together as a fourth concert series, and then we wanted the contemporary voice, and Liliana and I happened to work on a um, top secret project that we are. Signed, have signed up like a way to say that we will never tell anybody what this project was. Maybe in a few years. Huh? Maybe No, we will be recorded. And um, and I I know her family, I know, you know, where her place is, and so I was just saying it makes sense. It just makes sense to, to invite her to, to to work on the contemporary piece. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shefali, would you like to talk about the Puerto Rican as, um, concept of the series? Um, good evening, everyone. I'm so honored to be here, and I want to thank um, Marina and Marina for uh, thinking of me and incorporating me as uh, one of the uh, co-directors and artistic directors of the Juan and Hector Lugo, another one of my mentors, he, um, he wasn't able to be here tonight, but we worked together in creating the concept, Yo Cantare, and Yo Cantare speaks to um, the, the stories of Puerto Rican women, not only from Puerto Rico, but also in the diaspora, um, through song, and um, all of the pieces had original aspects to, to them, and the way, the way that we envisioned um, the Yo Cantare um, installation or, or project or presentation was um, through the voices and the creativity of our students of the Bay Area Women's Workshop. So we, we invited students like Marina, 
Um, we invited, you know, other other uh, uh, practitioners of bomba, plena, maestros like Romanito Carrillo, um, percussionists like Javier Navarrete, uh, Mari Luna, and all of these folks contributed um, their voices uh, through through the different pieces that we had created, and so. Um, Yo cantaré questions um, the representation of women, of Puerto Rican women, um, whether it's colonial representations, whether it's present day uh, representations that are still based on um, our colonial struggles um, and realities. And uh, the, the, the beautiful, one, one of the most beautiful things for me um, in, in and seeing how how the students um, were able, how how the participants were able to uh, create um, through Yo Cantare was that you know whether it was poetry, whether it was through playing the the barri, whether it's you know through uh, rap, whether it was um, through singing uh, bolero, which Marina will hopefully talk a little bit about. They were able to give their voice and share their voice and their experiences of either being Puerto Rican, living in, living in the diaspora, um, or being connected to Puerto Rican cult music and culture. Because um, many of the participants of our workshop, um, some, some of the participants in our, in our workshop are not Puerto Rican, but they've been connected to bomba music and dance. They've been connected to plena music and dance. And, um, and that connection um, definitely also contributed to the flourishing of what happened. And so some of, some of uh, the examples of what um, uh, you weren't able to see if you weren't there. Oh, and by the way, this is my son, Amari, for sure. Oh, so he has me. And he, he helps define me and who I am and my voice as, as a woman today and teaches me so much. So um, so some, some of the examples of, of the magic that happened um, included a song that I borrowed from a colleague from Puerto Rico, Marian Torres Lopez. She wrote a song called Mujer Boricua. And so La Mujer Puerto Riqueña, La Mujer Boricua, she is redefining through this song, through, through the performance of the song, she redefines what it is to be a Puerto Rican woman, whether it's a leader, an activist, um, uh, women who are helping rebuild the island, um, even way before Maria, through um, whether it's agriculture, whether it's uh, teaching, um, generations of uh, bomba practitioners, um, and if, if you don't know what Bomba is, I'll, I'll maybe talk a little bit about it. Um, right now, Bomba is um, Bomba is a music and dance from Puerto Rico. It originates over 300 years ago in the sugar cane plantations of the island, where folks were forced to work um, under horrendous and even beyond um, conditions that we're not really necessarily aware connected with because it happened way back then, but we try to tell those stories through song and through the passing down of oral uh, history. And so Bomba was used to create um, solidarity, um, to resist, and was one of the ways that um, ab the abolition of slavery was achieved, was an example of how powerful Bomba music was. To uh, in contributing to the abolition of, of slavery in Puerto Rico, and um, so Marien Torres speaks to what is la mujer boricua, and la mujer boricua eh, is a leader. She's a mother. She's a builder. There's so many different things that define who is a Puerto Rican woman, and I'm still learning that today. My personal inspiration, which Marien also talks. Um, talks about in this song. Um, this is two women that I visited uh, almost uh, in 1999 in the Dublin uh, women's prison, and they're now freed. And Lucia Pagan and Carmen Valentin, they contributed to my really strong desire to 
help future generations, current and future generations, learn what bomba music is, what bomba dancing is. Without knowing who we are as Puerto Ricans, um, we we will not be we, we will not be free. We will not be liberated from systems of colonial oppression. So they both of them visiting them. Um, they 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 were locked up for seditious conspiracy um, to free Puerto Rico, and all of their work um, helped me understand why it's important to continue the practice. Um, of Bomba and teach to to teach the youth that currently take our classes in the Bomba Bena workshop, and um, and so they they taught me about Puerto Rican history. They taught me um, about how their work contributed to elevating the definition and redefining what what Puerto Rican what what it what it is to be Puerto Rican today and and also back in the day and how those. Those are connected. So, and then, uh, can I speak about one more, one more piece? Yes. So, um, another piece that um, I, I, I'm directly connected with um, because I wrote one of the songs, and then I, um, I, I co-created this, the joining of, of this actual piece with one of the youth in our in our variable Madera workshop, Lyris Robles, and she wrote Una, and the song talks about being mothered. So the experience of a child and how it is for her um, being being mothered. And so she speaks to the lyrics, talk about una cerca del mar, mecida por el viento, las estrellas vigilan, una cerca del mar. So it's talking about and, and comparing how the ocean, um, how the ocean as powerful as her mother, you know, mothered her. And sway, sways her to sleep, and you know, that la, la, las estrellas vigilan, the stars guide her, and she compares how the stars are like her mother. And so I, I related so much to her piece, you know, because I'm he, he's my son, and I'm, I'm a really technically a first time mom, and understanding a little bit more about what my what he might be feeling as as my son, and then. Her, her piece, Una, came together with the piece that I wrote, Sola, and the lyrics of Sola say, Sola, Sola me voy, Sola, Sola me voy, Sola, Sola me voy. So, in, in being able to travel alone, there's something, that there's guidance. So I'm able to walk alone in life because I have the guidance of, of my mother, and I have the guidance of my teachers, of my ancestors. And so that 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 connection um, closed uh, the evening, and it was very very powerful. So I'm estoy sola. I'm alone, but I'm alone because I'm estoy acompañada because I I have the strength of the women that have guided me, and also from Lyris' perspective, the strength of the women or her mother that has guided her and continued to guide her. So that was. That was powerful, and Lyris uh, played the guitar, and then we had a, a, a traditional bomba part in, in, in this piece, which was also uh, played in, in, in Bomba Yuba, combined with her skills with the guitar. And so all of the, uh, the, the, the power in the relationship and culminating with all of the women on stage um, supporting and accompanying um, this this young girl who was moving into womanhood. Thank you, Chef. Mm -hmm. Camila, would you like to talk about the Mujeres de Peru? Um, can I have a translator? Yes. Do we have some way to translate? Can you hear the translator? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Mama, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm not stressed. <laughs>
Yo lo pensé dos veces, porque el Perú es demasiado variado, es muy, muy variado y poder hablar de una mujer del Perú es yo misma, que siendo de japoneses, mis abuelos son japoneses de Okinawa, ¿no? Nací, eh, es, me considero parte de la cultura criolla de la costa del Perú y aquí soy nacionalizada americana, entonces, y, y soy peruana. ¿no? Entonces, así como yo, la directora musical Cheta Robles, que ella desciende de africanos, y cuando nosotros hablamos en la calle, nos dicen qué idioma hablan y por qué, dónde aprendieron español. Entonces, es difícil entender, ¿no? eh, y los que somos peruanos sabemos eso muy bien, eh, que una persona del norte del Perú al, al biplano, a la cordillera de los Andes, y a la costa de Lima no tienen nada en común. Hablan diferentes idiomas, están condicionados por otra geografía, por otro clima, por condición social, política, económica, raza, nacionalidad, género, etc. <risa> Um, 
but all the other women in, the, in, in Poo, no, I remember Poo. So then there is uh, women in Poo school, which is the uh, most, Peru is known more for Machu Picchu and the, and the, and the Andes, and there is women that are, that are um, used for celebrations of, of fertility of, of the Pachamama, which is um, the uh, celebration for the uh, uh, Earth. Earth. Um, finally, I chose uh, women from, from Lima. And um, when I came to Lima, uh, where, is where I come from, which is the capital of Peru, I used, um, I used a, um, the image of a microbus, which is a, a bus. And all the women that will come in the bus will be one representative of, of what today the Peruvian women you can, you can uh, see out in the streets. Mm -hmm. So she can be like um, uh, somebody who begs for money or somebody who goes to school or an important politician or a mother or a street vendor or so. The story goes around with music and theater and dance. And that's how I portray. I try to portray Peruvian women in the camera. Yeah. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you for speaking. Thank you. Liliana, what about the contemporary side of the <laughs> Well, the, the contemporary story. side, I also want to mention how important it is to have multilingual spaces. And we see clearly how important it is and how we need to, when we talk about colonization, that's one of the things I think we can all do together. Um, is to break those patterns of English dominance in every single space that we're in because the world is made of many languages, many cultures. And which takes me to uh, to what inspired me to, and I'm still doing research on this on my show, Bolondina means Swango. Um, so uh, the archetype really that was that uh, prevailed in my show was this, this swallow, this Golondrina, sort of traveling through California and talking about the stories that are uh, often not told in, in our history books. Um, I'm a California native. I don't know how many people are native Californians here. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you have you heard of the gold rush? <laughs> um, have you heard of the Spanish missions? Um, 21 missions. So uh, the Golondrina, this this uh, swallow, kind of the story takes us on its very poetic storytelling, uh, a little bit of monologues, uh, but primarily really uh, dispels the, the myth that resistance was not part of. of the original inhabitants of California, that they passively accepted colonization and the violence and the rupture that, that colonization continues to bring, right? Con continues to divide humanity. And so I wanted to talk about these stories through the perspective of this bird, that's the swallow that's migrating because we we value and we celebrate migration when we, when we think about it in a mystical way, like the swallows of Capistrano. Have you guys heard of those? The, so the Golondrina is sort of like the epitome of the, the swallow of Capistrano that flies from Argentina to uh, Southern California, the, uh, uh, the OC, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and how people gather since the 1930s, they've been gathering and like, wow, here they come, you know, migration, and, and it just it just really disturbed me how we see human beings as invaders, and we see birds as this majestic, uh, you know, natural, spiritual, uh, uh, migratory pattern, you know, of, of beings, right, that can openly and freely migrate and they don't need visas or passports or green cards or disgusting presidents uh, to call them to be. Um, um, and so I really wanted to talk about these stories and in my research I, I found all these incredible stories and journeys of people uh, that I had never heard of in my life. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I'm a California kid, and <laughs> I have never heard these stories, and, and all these stories, uh, so it's sort of like a story within stories and songs, and um, 
And in fact, this is now going to be, uh, part of my work is going to be incorporated in an animated film that's uh, we're just embarking on this project called Eureka. Um, and I will be reprising the show in the fall in, at the Bravo Theater in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> focused a lot on, uh, I've worked with some incredible musicians, we were a small cohort of people, but um, we really put out, uh, the, the soundscape itself was very beautiful, and I'm very, very pleased with that. Um, and so, you know, you kind of, kind of brought together, you know, um, this tapestry of people and stories and voices that I had never heard before. Primarily, there was one, one archetype that really struck me, her name was Toypolina, and she was one of the uh, first, if not maybe the only that is considered, uh, is very young, she's 24 years old, and she led a rebellion in the San Gabriel Missions in Southern, in LA, the LA Basin. And uh, this was in the late 1700s, and she was one of the many resistors of the missions. Um, you know, the missions were very, very brutal um, on indigenous people, uh, and uh, it's sort of the Holocaust, right beneath our feet that we never talk about in, in California it was, you know, it was a very diverse, linguistically diverse place. We spoke over a hundred languages. Uh, they, uh, as far as like the wildfires, I just saw a book out there about the wildfires, that they always happened in California. However, indigenous groups knew how to contain the fires. They would set fires in small areas and then contain the fires. So they knew they had all this knowledge, all this wisdom from thousands of years back. And when the colonizers came, uh, they pretty much said, no, you're done. <laughs> you're going to be our slaves. And if you don't like it, we will torture you, rape you, and uh, burn you, and burn crosses on your head, you know, forehead. And so, so there's all this um, very, you know, majestic story about California, but underneath it, there's a lot of brutality. And so I was trying to find a way to talk about, honestly, but very, be very transparent about this brutality that we never talk about um, in a way that we can, we can celebrate the resistance and the resilience of people that came before us. And I really feel that the solutions of our, our problems in the world and in our, in our nation is really we need to go back to our indigenous roots because all of us here have indigenous roots. It's just some of us are more closer connected to it than others. But trust me, we all have an indigenous root. And that was, uh, I think, what I felt more, most passionate about in, in this project. And La Golondrina is also what my mother always called me. Oh, La Golondrina, like, when are you gonna like, settle down, right? So I brought in some stories with my mother and my father and, and uh, kind of personalize it and bring some humor, even though I'm a very serious person. But, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I wanted to bring in as, as, uh, also the musical influences, right, that, that I grew up with and that we, we can all connect to. <laughs> and I want to say, just witnessing Liliana's concert, it was the most beautiful history lesson. And it's true that it was about all these like very painful stories, but the resistance and the resilience part were, were highlighted. And so it felt very empowering, even with the tra you know there were tragic stories from you know indigenous you know Holocaust to gentrification, because you yes. also talk about gentrification yes. in one of them in a blues song. She had blues as well. And that's <laughs> also, yes. Uh, oh, I thought the money raised the <laughs> uh, I have a lot of questions, but I would actually uh, like to ask our audience if there's any questions that you would like to ask any of our panelists. And I can start, but I would really hope, because you know we, we, we don't have a lot of time, so is there anybody who would like to ask any questions to our panelists? Yes. Thank you. Um, this work to the general panel, um, I was just curious to... Um, maybe ask how the conversations are having here in California in this day and age, how some of them maybe go back to the countries that you've come from, um, or the cultures that you've come from, and it's sort of, uh, I guess, what is that context of it happening here versus happening there? And what is that conversation, if there is one, to general? For me, um that's a very important part of this. Um, my concert hasn't happened yet, 
question I was thinking about what we did for the Giovanni concert that we you know we study the folkloric tradition but we reinterpret it coming from all different experiences you know always with respect and you know studying the tradition first so Shefali and Hector Lugo and her teachers Romani de they uh, they really give us a solid foundation about the history and especially for us who are you know like me as a white person coming from Italy being here as a Ana Lisa, like you know, so kind of being this in between space as well, with all my privilege and you know, with my story, but also like learning from this community. And I have to say, our teachers encourage us to have a dialogue with the tradition, so not impose our view, but have our dialogue with the tradition. And Chef, I don't know if this resonates with what you're trying to do with us, but this is what I am learning from you all. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, um, I think that, that it is important when you're learning the tradition to do your best to um, honor um, what your teachers have taught you. And that, that goes not only for, you know, our students to honor what we're teaching, but for us to be responsible educators and students as well in the tradition. And so we, we really want our students to have, like you said, um, and you know, the participants, our collaborators, a, a, a critical relationship with, um, with the art form, but also to be creative and to create based on the structures that, you know, that they have learned and to have their own um, interpretations because bomba, for instance, is a personal experience. So you learn, for example, I focus on the dance, uh, you learn a basic step, you learn basic structures of, you know, how uh, a bomba or a bomba jam, a bomba toque operates, um, but then you have a conversation with it and you're able to, to create, like Marina, she wrote, um, uh, in, in the workshop, students uh, not only learn uh, bomba, but they, are, they also uh, learn about plena, which is a younger musical tradition, um, uh, musical tradition from Puerto Rico, um, and they also are able to come in contact in some form with musica jibara, or music from the mountains, and other instruments like the, the guaco, um, and how it's played in Puerto Rico. So, so Marina was able to write, wrote um, a beautiful bolero uh, honoring two Puerto Rican um, archetypes um, that have influenced many other songwriters and practitioners, Silvia Rexach and, and Julia de Burgos. And so that, you know, Marina has, has written, you know, a, a few songs, um, and I know that her experience is spoken through these songs. And some of the other students wrote, um, uh, uh, participants um, <clears throat> wrote songs about um, the migratory experience. Puerto Rico it is conti it continues to be redefined through the, the migration experience historically, and, and, and now even more so after Hurricane Maria, there's been an exodus and so many people have left the island. But for me, the true inspiration, um, and, and specifically speaking of women and, and women role models that I've had, is all the women who have decided to stay. Y en Puerto Rico decimos pajarnos. Fajarse, like really, you know, like, what's the definition for fajarse? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell yourself. Like, like, have you seen me tell you? Yeah, like, yourself stayed yourself. and built their workshops. Mm -hmm. I just spoke with um, with uh, one woman who has done work out here, brought her, um, her, her work out here, paid up with this, and she had to close her, um, her workshop, and then she would faith and community support. She reopened and um, has, I think she said over 150 students, but it's just been an uphill battle. And so those are examples of, um, uh, for, for that inspire me to do the work that I do over here. The, the examples of women uh, doing the work in Puerto Rico, and it's way harder, way harder. And, um, and so in honor of those women and in honor of the, the, our teachers um, <clears throat> and the fact that bomba music and plena music is flourishing in Puerto Rico and also as a form of resistance and uh, self-determination, um, you know, I continue to do the work here um, in collaboration with Eto Lugo and the inspiration of all shop participants. So um, Puerto Rico is is is, is not um, what people imagine post uh, post Hurricane Maria as devastating as as it was and continues to be. Puerto Rico has there there's my interpretation is that the island has um, solidified in many different ways and although the the, the economy, uh, the, there's a struggle to build the economy because of, because it's a colony and the, the fiscal 
there's a fiscal controller who controls the money that uh, Puerto Ricans are, the, the, the economic support that schools get, that infrastructures get, etc., that do not know what it means to be Puerto Rican or who, and that Puerto, Ric Puerto Ricans are not in their best interest. So um, we are much more than, than what people might imagine post Hurricane Maria. Any questions you want to add something? Uh, I, well, as far as like, uh, I was thinking about what you said about, you know, coming from another place, I feel uh, one of the things that I also, uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful for, to hear these amazing artists uh, keep you know, inspiring and taking notes of it. <laughs> um, uh, but the whole identity of being a Chicana, um, a Chikonda, <laughs> I don't want to say, um, is, uh, is, <laughs> is a reality, right, of being, of being, there's a song that, that says, no soy de aquí, ni soy de allá, right, I'm not from here, I'm not from there, where am I from, and uh, my own personal experience growing up uh, in this country, born and raised in this country, um, so when people say, where are you from? I will say, occupied territory, right? California. Um, uh, and of course, uh, you know, that it's like you're a hybrid person. I'm a hybrid person within a hybrid society, you know. And um, it's been very a very rich experience to really delve into that Chicanismo and, and kind of reclaiming my indigenous uh, root and knowing that I have in my European root and you know and uh, and it really really inspires me to think of the Americas as uh, you know and I'm just saying when she said I'm an American I thought well of course she's from Peru South America is part of America <laughs> um, and sort of like working around decolonizing our mind in the sense of uh, really bringing respect like you're saying respect to uh, you know uh, through music, Bomba Plena, and um, that also inspires me to continue to to delve into this work, and this cultural work, um, and really bring it to the point of the issues that we're dealing with today, right? And gentrification in the Bay Area specifically is a very, very brutal reality for many people, um, and a violent reality for many people too, uh, like Alex Nieto, who was who was killed and shot 57 times uh, several years ago because somebody from the now gentrified Bernal Heights area was scared to see a big brown guy with a 49ers jacket eating a burrito. They called the police and they just came in and shot him, you know, 57 times. And he was a San Francisco native, a practicing Buddhist, uh, you know, very loved in the, beloved in the community. And this is just one of many examples of what gentrification causes and it's murder. And um, and again, I think we need to kind of connect the pieces of the past and how it's repetitive now and and find solutions, right? Work together to find the solutions and not just be observers, but actually be participants, willing participants to change the dialogue and to realize that our, um, that our voices need to be heard. And sometimes songs and dance that's how we are hurt sometimes, especially as women, right? Um, and uh, it's a very powerful tool, a very powerful tool. Yeah. I bet I would you like to add something to this topic? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Efecto espectáculo y lo que está pasando. Bueno, una de las cosas que yo considero que, que nos dimos todos cuenta cuando hicimos el programa fue que no sabíamos nada. So what is the thing that we found out is like we didn't know. We didn't know what was going on. When, they, when, they, when she was working in that program. Because I work with, uh, I think with 30 people around and we were all Colombians uh -huh. and we were all from different places and we were doing things from different areas that we have never been there mm -hmm. or exposed to those areas. So I think we learned a lot. Si estás hablando acerca de cómo se compara, I don't think there has been a problem like that in Peru. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it will be as open as I could have done it here than over there. Mm -hmm. And I think it will be beautiful to put this program and take it there mm -hmm. to Peru. Because, mm -hmm. yes, because even, even for Peruvians, um, even Peruvians, they don't know, you know, yeah. it's very different and very uh, segregated, everything, class and economics and mm -hmm. culture and everything is very different. So I think um, here in California, uh, we, we are lucky to be able to express where we came from, who we are, mm -hmm. you know, without being uh, kind of judge or, or, or segregated, segregated. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying something about, you know, what she just said. This is why we're connected, because this is how Gabriela operates and has always operated. All the shows she has, has done that I've been a part of with her have always been about the diaspora and how we're all connected. And she's talking specifically about Peru, which has done programs that are, I mean, that included Mexico, that included Puerto Rico. That's why I know Echo as well as to, and then the Ministry of through uh, Gabriela and these shows that she's done. Um, and these things that are just very natural and how, you know, um, become very powerful forces. Um, and a woman, and one of the questions that you had prompted us with is about new archetypes. And um, I know we're kind of going all over the place with what an archetype is, but um, um, when I saw that question, I was like, how can you even have a new archetype? Because an archetype is about something, not a stereotype, mm -hmm. but it's something that's deep-seated in your psyche, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, I didn't, I was like, I don't think I can answer that question. That, that doesn't really exist. That's kind of contrary to. But now as I'm sitting listening to what you just said, and listening to what all of us have been saying about what we're doing, to me the new archetype is um, strength and, you know, warrior and activist and powerful. Women don't get to find that way. You know, women aren't pictured that way. The, the feminine archetypes are things like mother, the things like uh, the wise old woman, but not the warrior. The warrior is a, a male archetype, historically. You know, and what you're seeing here, I think, is is a disruption to that those archetypes. Um, and it's um, it's something that has proven the test of time. You know, I, I know Shirley's been doing her work for at least 20 years, probably longer. Um, and and and. I want you to remember and listen to how many of us continue to give credit to the people around us and to their male counterparts. You don't necessarily hear the flip of that, okay? And, and that is definitely one of the tensions in putting this series out, putting my concert out, is being very careful about that language. Um, and it's, it's real and it's, it's deserved. Recognize, I recognize that it doesn't always happen on the flip side, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think those are things that are breaking the archetype and that are changing and, and expanding these archetypes. So, in any of your cultures, are there matrilineal lineages? Because I just saw a film that was that was called Bird Paradise yep. about Colombia, and oh. it was the Wadi people. There's a matrilineal society. 
And actually, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to meet with some women from that uh, from that community. But from the countries you come from, is there a tradition of more of the women if you, leaders? There's an, I thought you were actually going to talk about another film, and I, and I have to think of it's. I think it's Bird of Fire or Bird of. I can't remember. I'll, I'll try to remember the name of it. But it's about uh, the Wantabek. It's about the, the isthmus of the Wantabek. That's the national society in in the Hilos, the the Yucatan. Uh, well, yeah, not the Yucatan. Uh, yeah, Yucatan. No, the Oaxaca. It's the Yucatan Peninsula, but the the state of Oaxaca. The Wantabek is in in Oaxaca, and the those those the 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 Wana, the Wana culture is natural. Right, because some of the historical work you're doing is fabulous, and touching on that, then it has also been in, an influence or can be a source well, of, of the work. In, in Mexico, you carry your mother's name right. forward with you as well, so you know, that does happen, although it's still a patriarch. Right. It dominates <laughs> patriarchal society. Thank you. And you were writing about the question that I told them, and I was like, oh, that didn't make sense. But I think my idea was, you used the word disruption, and I think that was where I was coming from, like how to disrupt these archetypes, how to expand these archetypes that are deep-seated in our psyche, but we can, we as you know, women living today in this specific contemporary time, how we can disrupt those archetypes. Yeah, so use them as these very kind of unconscious ideas that we have, but giving them our own uh, shape, you know, and uh, voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you for using that word because I think that's what we have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Natalia. I just want to give a testimony about something that's what you just said, you know, uh, what we've all been talking about. So I work at La Peña and I've had the privilege of working with three um, of these wonderful teaching artists and artists, um, Shefali, Gabriela, and Maria through their classes that they teach at La Peña regularly. And I've only met Liliana when I was introduced to her by Maria to do the Golomirina piece, which all of your pieces completely have moved me so much, and I can't wait to see that the it is. June 29th at Brava Theater. Um, so, but what I want to give testimony to is that um, when they're talking about these archetypes through dance, through music, through these performing arts or community jam formats, um, actually like influencing society through art. I witness it every day at La Reina. Like little kids as young as Raji here, um, learning their traditions. Maybe one parent is Puerto Rican. Maybe their grandma is Puerto Rican. Maybe their neighbor's Puerto Rican and that's why they're in that class. Like and it gives a sense of identity to the kids, and it gives a sense of identity to the adults. And the same thing with Gabriela's class, you know, they are, uh, Gabriela and Peta are consistently every week teaching um, Afro-Peruvian cajon. You know, you see cajon a lot in like flamenco music, that is a Peruvian instrument. You get to learn that and you get a sense of identity from, um, and respect, you know, a lot of multicultural respect. You know, no one's going to try to say that the cajon is from Spain. At La Peña, we know better, right? Um, and so, and then with Maria, she teaches Son Jarocho every Wednesday. And that's um, the dance format and the um, harana format and song structure and all that. And you see third generation uh, Chicano kids, you see first generation Spanish, monolingual Spanish speakers in the same class learning with each other and um, it's just like multi-generational um, many levels of um, languages learned and um, it's just unifies an identity for each community and they're so open and warm and inviting that you can just show up and do this so this is a testimony I want to give about these classes is that it is they're important the arts do influence your sense of identity and when you're oppressed um, you need that sense of identity to to really make you not feel like you need to be um, assimilated into um, and and internally like oppressed like mentally, which I have seen a lot in Texas. I grew up in Texas, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> so I just want to give testimony to like how important the arts really are when it comes to changing like society. 
because the art is the people. The people push this art form out. You, you get to be, you know, you voice your opinions, but you also internally do a lot of work. It's not just what you're putting out there, it's like also what, how you, it makes you feel and the community we build. And so you guys are amazing. And if I keep talking, I'm going to cry. So I just want to give that to me. Thank you. Well, that was yeah. sound for you while you're going out. I know. Yeah. Yeah. We have time maybe for one last question. Anybody has like a burning question between us?
but I talk about them in the same way that my maestros have talked about them. So oftentimes I'm passing their information, on, their, their, their stories on, um, but also my um, experiences traveling and how and being a part of the culture, being a part of the Fandango, and, and then um, and actually say those things. But a lot of it, like Shakali said, it's already inherent. It comes in, it comes down through the song. And so when I'm talking in class, and you know, y'all can, um, I have at least six students here, by the way, who can attest to when I'm talking right here. Um, but I get it from my maestros. <laughs> He tells us about the context, and he tells us about the history, and he tells us about the stories. And the reason you do that is because we are sharing these experiences. You know, this is not just us that's dealing with this stuff. You know, with whatever trials and tribulations we're dealing with, it's um, it's common to all of us. And when we come together in this space and we learn these things, you're going to hear it in the songs and the verses that we sing. Um, and specific words that I may not know what those, that word is, but when I teach my class, okay, well, this word means this, and there's a reason it means that, you know? Um, those are things that are being passed down to it. So that's, that's partly what I'm passing to and what I'm doing. But I take my cues from my masters. And the other thing I want to say about that is that they have encouraged us, um, and we have done that, and that's where, you know, my biggest start, biggest creative start uh, project started with La Peña in 2014, where we created, created new songs or new compositions that um, were talking about our experience here. And it, but these, these same experiences are experiences that they could relate to. So it was a team of uh, maestros, Michel was one of them, and a team of uh, uh, musicians from here, we got together, created uh, uh, several new songs um, that talk about, and it's in the form of song. That's what song is for. So what you listen to, what we play, what we're learning to play, and this is what attracted me so much to Bomba and Lena is because they're doing the same thing. What they're what they're talking about is their his their history, you know, their current contemporary, you know. Um, issues, you know, there's a lot of stuff around the hurricane, and rightly so, you know, and that's what's happening in Song as well, that we're, they're talking about corruption, they're talking, and it's contemporary, mm -hmm. that's the verses that's coming out. The fact that we're doing this, the absolute fact, just the fact that you're getting together every Wednesday night to sit down in the class and pull a haran out, that to me is resistance. I don't have to go out, to, I mean, I, I do, but I don't have to go out to a march, you know, I'm not on this, I might not be out this, right, I might not, not be the person, that, but just the fact that I continue to do this, despite everything that's going on, you know, and I take it into the schools too, like I actually teach music, and I, and I use song, I usually most use song. Um, the day after the, the elections, I was so defeated, I was just like, I was sick. And I woke up that morning, and I was like, because I had been teaching in Spanish to kids that were not Spanish speakers, um, and I was teaching soy. And I got up that morning, like, maybe I better not do this anymore, you know? And that's how bad I, I was like, I can't believe this. You know, I was so surprised that I had no finger on my, the pulse of what was going on. I was like, am I really that out of touch? You know, and I was scared. In that moment, um, it took me like two seconds, and I did, you know, I said, you know what, no. The opposite. I grabbed my harana, I put on an embroidered blouse, and I went back and I taught son de los in Spanish, you know. I'm like, no, more than it. And that is, that's what this is of resistance. This is what happened with Bomba. We talked about how that this is how they brought down the slavery, right? Um, One of the ways that they brought down slavery, you know, all you had to do is just getting that group together freaks people out. <laughs> <laughs> freaks people out. That's there's power in it. There's a lot of power in it. And now, would you have to close? There is. Well, I was going to say thank you so much for those inspiring words. I think there is a lot of power, and I think we all. Uh, 
can benefit from connecting culturally with each other. Um, I think that we are compelled to take action in life, just as human nature uh, uh, tells us more than what we think logically is what we feel. And until we feel something, we, we can connect to other people with empathy. And I think that's that's a key um, thing for us to, to consider and to keep taking with us. Um, and one of the first things that I thought of when I was trying to figure out uh, what I was going to do with my project, it was one of the first thoughts that I wrote down and I thought, where do we find our roots, the veins of our existence, if not under the foundations we lay beneath the concrete and the musk where the soil breaks, forming underground byways to our past and future generations. And um, I think that we have, if all of us here in this room can connect to other people with what we've learned today, what we feel today, um, we, can, we can continue spreading um, this message, right? And, uh, and healing. And I feel like the, the colonized, world that we live in, it doesn't just hurt the people that are colonized, it hurts the colonizers yeah. as well. And uh, through my work around the country as an interpreter and uh, an artist, one of the things that I hear a lot from white folks that come up to me and they're like, I'm so pissed that I don't have a culture that I just have hot dogs and hamburgers. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You have to search. You have to search because perhaps you have some connection to some incredible music like in the Appalachian regions, right, where they have all this very ancient Celtic music, and it's connected. It's just that, like I said before, just to reiterate, like we are all, we all have an indigenous root, and um, it's up to us to find it. And sometimes we find it through our, our the person right next to us, right? So let's keep connecting. <laughs> let's give a round of applause. and how awesome these women are and I feel so honored that I 10 years ago when I moved to California I had a lot of Puerto Rican friends and they introduced me to Bomba because like La Pena said for me like I'm not Puerto Rican but for me La Pena is my second home and I feel so touched by what you have created as teachers as artists as community leaders it's like I've never seen that anywhere else and it is special. It is special and I thank La Peña for that. And thank you the Department of Anthropology for hosting us tonight. This was very special. Thank you all.